How can the love of God be spread abroad? Yet Jesus said, Guide us, we pray. Help us to be servants worthy of our heart. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Appreciate the prayer and appreciate the brother Bill. Praise God. Thank well, I told you last week we would begin a new series. It will take us about three or four weeks. And we'll not be on this while we're up on the mountain, but we'll join right back in the following Sunday if the Lord's tarried is coming. And uh, been praying about this for a long, long time. And uh, just to uh, reiterate some things, uh, about a month ago we have done about four or five Sunday nights uh, where we got some feedback from um, from you all, from the congregation, of why the church is in the position or the shape that it's in. And there was a lot of different things um, that come up in those four and five week studies of that, and, and it was great to study it out. But this morning, it's funny how God works, and he finally gave us liberty on this. We're going to preach on a subject that's kind of been uh, pushed away, that people kind of go around, that nobody likes to talk about. But can I say this, that in Scripture it is mentioned more times than heaven or hell. It is something that ought to make a Baptist blood pressure, or a Methodist, or Presbyterian, or Episcopalian, or whatever you may be this morning, or wherever your upbringing was, make your blood pressure rise, not because it worries you, but because it's a thing of God. It ought to make you break out in cold sweats, and we'll get to the subject. I know you are anticipating what it's going to be. I can see it on your faces already. But I want this, uh, to really look at what God's Word says about these few subjects over the next few weeks. And this is one of the things that was given to me as feedback from you all. So if you don't like it, blame yourselves and talk to Him because He's the one that gave me liberty to Amen. preach this message. Right, <laughs> Somebody in here this morning ought to have a shouting fit over this subject. We're going to preach on this morning. Tithes. Offerings and special givings. And we're going to do it out of love. We're going to be excited. Y'all don't look so drooped over. Y'all don't, y'all say, get excited. Y'all say, it. get excited. Get excited. Say, I'm excited. I'm excited. All right, it's a little bit. Loosen you up a little bit. That's the Lord. You say, well, that tithe in this Old Testament, I agree. You'll not find the word tithe in your New Testament, not one time, but you'll find it throughout the pages from Matthew to Revelation. I believe with all my heart. Jesus himself spoke of money more than heaven or hell combined. Oh my, just, did y'all hear that? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, spoke more of our money than he did heaven and hell combined. That's a wake-up call, is it not? But there's a reason. First of all, I want to make this general statement. I, I believe just about all of our deacons and trustees is here and members of this congregation. First of all, the pastor does not want your money. The Lord has blessed me through his people. They take care of me, and I have nothing to do at this church with the money. Just make sure uh, under good leadership that it's appointed correctly. I have nothing to do with the offering that's taken up every Sunday morning. There's people that's appropriated for that. So this is not a plea from your preacher. I'm not saying plant your $50 seed and you'll be a millionaire by Monday morning. That's not what I'm getting at this morning. But the Bible does lay out some things in this and I'm excited. I, I believe this, this is a great help to me and I believe with all my heart God will it, it, it'll let it be a great help to you. A tithe. It simply means one tenth. Ten percent. Now at the end of this I hope that we all know what the difference between a tithe is and what an offering is and what a special gift is. We're going to clear that up in this series this morning. And I hear this all the time from all age groups. It's the common thing. Preacher, I can afford to tithe. I hear it all the time. Pastor, I can't afford to tithe. By the end of this series, Lord willing, you'll say this. Lord, I cannot afford not to tithe. Amen. Amen. I cannot afford not to tithe. If you have your Bibles this morning, let's look at Genesis 
chapter number 14. Genesis chapter number 14. And as you're turning, I want to give you some statistics taken up by some barn of holes, people of the church. In 2016, they've not come out with an updated report, and if you've been at the men's prayer group, you've heard these numbers. Very short. This. Christians today, churchgoers, faith-based people of Christianity, tithe, the percentage of people that tithe is this. Two and a half percent. Two and a half percent. To give you a little idea of how far we've fallen, in the thing called the Great Depression, now some of you may have been born in that, maybe lived through a little bit of it. I don't think anybody in here was at the preceding of that that I know of. But in the Great Depressions, you know how much Christians tithe? 3.3 percent. But in 2016, as a whole, we've fallen to 2.5 percent. Now, Here's the thing. If those people who've done without everything and anything could give God 3.3%, I believe us that is well blessed this morning could do a little better than two and a half, don't you? Yeah. Amen. Some more to this, and we'll get the Bible. I promise I'll get you the Bible this morning. The average tithe of, a, of an American Christian this morning, and this broke my heart, the average tithe of all American Christians this morning is a $17 a week tithe. $17. $17. We find that not only is that bad, but only 37% of all churchgoers tithe regularly. We find that 77% of the ones that regularly tithe give more than that 10% Upwards of 20%, and that is where we get into the offering part. We'll get into that in weeks ahead. And I love this part, and this will make the devil cringe, and some of you in here, 7 out of 10%, or 7 out of 10 of all tithe payers, I love it, pay off the gross and not the net. Amen. Amen. They pay off the groves. You say, well, what's that? You know that pay stuff you get? That first number? That's the groves. Not after everything's been taken out. I love this part. 97% of all those that do tithe regularly make tithing their first priority. Make it their first priority. You say, what do you mean by that? They pay their tithes before they pay their life bill. They buy... They pay their tithes before they buy their groceries. They pay their tithes before they pay their mortgage payment or their credit card. They have made it their top financial priority. Now I promise you upon the authority of God's word when we get done with this first message on tithing, I promise you, you will say this. And if you're not, you need to find the prayer closet and say, Lord, show me what I need to be. But you can say this all day long with me. As a Christian, I cannot afford not to tithe. Why? Because it's his. It's not yours. It's not mine. That tent belongs to God. Check him off the first box instead of the last, and I promise you begin to see his blessings. This ain't a get rich quick series. This ain't nothing but to be obedient to God and his commandments and his statute. All right, y'all ready? Genesis chapter 14. In verse 14, y'all bear with me. It said, and when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants before or born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. 
And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaddai, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, and he said, Bless Blessed be Abra of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And notice what Abraham done. It said, and he gave him tithe of all. And the king of Sodom, or Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me thy persons and take thy goods to thyself. And Abram said, notice what he says to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a few latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldst say, I have made Abraham rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner is called man. Let them take their portion. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. We thank you for being so good to us this morning. God, we thank you for the provision that you've made in our life. God, we thank you that we might be able to tithe as your people. God, that you commanded us to do it. Lord, that we can live by it, that we can trust in it, that we can, uh, Lord, depend on it. And Father, I pray it would be a great help to somebody this morning. Lord, that may be, uh, Lord, just out of the way. Lord, that may, needs to be brought back unto you. I don't know. This may not be the message, but Lord, I feel there's something here this morning. God, that we can all get help from. Lord, if there's one here that's lost in the, uh, Lord, and knows you're not in the free pardon of sin, I pray today would be the day of salvation. You said your word would not return void, and I believe that with all my heart. In Jesus' name I pray and ask. Amen. Amen. Here we have a fellow by the name of Abram. Or Abraham as it's later called. We find that he goes out to battle. Simply because they had taken his nephew Lot. We all know the story later on of Sodom and Gomorrah and all that. But we find that, that Abram goes out and with 318 people. 318 people destroys four kings and their nations. Brings back his brother, uh, his brother's son Lot. And the family, the women, the children, and all the goods. But if we read the life of Abram, we find a few things that leads up to this case. We find um, that Abram had a few things going for him. Now we study out and we find uh, not one particular reason. Uh, and Brother Michael touched on this in Sunday school, why Abram was called. But we do have some insight on why he was. One of those things we find, and, and I'm going to give you some scripture. We'll not turn to it. Uh, this morning, but I want you to read it when you get home. In the preceding chapter, just read that whole thing. You'll find that Abram was an humble man. We need some more humble Christians today. Amen. You say, why was Abram humble? Well, the Lord said this. He's he, he seen that Abram and Lot could not dwell together. Their herdsmen, the Bible says in chapter 13, that they just could not get along. Now, most of us as alpha males would have stood up and the Lord said, uh, you all choose. And Abram stepped down. And he said, Law, you choose and I'll take the other side. That's what he said. I'm paraphrasing this morning. He was humble. Can I say most of us this morning would have kind of been like Lot stepped up and said, Lord, I'll take that pretty green grass before that water's flowing down there by the spring. And you give my dear brother this desert land over here. Amen. But Abram said, give it to him. He stepped down. He was an humble man. Not only that, we find in the same chapter around the 14th through the 17th verse that he was a favored man. I don't know about you, but I want God's favor on my life. I want to be favored. And I believe God favors some of the other. Why does John call himself the disciple whom Jesus loved? John wasn't bragging. He was bragging on Jesus. God showed him favor. Let me ask you this. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, uh, not to get off subject, but when he was hanging on the cross, who did he leave the care of his mother to? 
John. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. We find that God said, well, since you've done that, Abram, since you humbled yourself, since you humbled it, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make your nation as the stars in the sky and the sand of the sea. And as far as you can walk that way, and as far as you can walk that way, and as far as you walk that way and that way, I'm going to give it to you. He was faithful. Now here's one thing I love. One of these days we're going to get to see Abraham's promise come to fruition. Amen. You see when, again, when Lot took that, he was still on Abraham's ground because it's all given to him by God. But he humbled himself before him. I'm going somewhere. Y'all just bear with me. He was faithful. In the same chapter we find that Abram was a faithful man. After the Lord promised him all that land, it said that Abram built an altar Unto the Lord. I find that in the life of Noah, in the life of Moses and Abraham, they all, the first thing they done when Noah got off the boat, it wasn't uh, all these things. He simply built an altar and worshiped God. Abraham done the same thing. You know what? When we begin to thank God and worship Him for what He's done, we get beside ourselves and our wants list will get very small because the things that God's blessed us with is very great. He was a favored man. And in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 16, we just read, notice this. And he brought back all the goods and all also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Can I say this? Not only was he an humble man, was he a, a favored man or a faithful man? And he was all those things, but he was a family man. There was a brother down there that needed his help. I want you to notice something that Abraham never done. He never pointed his finger at, at Lot and said, look what you've done, look where you've been, and look what I had to come and do to get you out of this mess. I see a little bit of Jesus, sir, don't you? Amen. Not pointing no fingers there. He said, I'm a family man. Boy, ain't you glad that God of heaven sent his son because he was a family man. And said, I don't care what they've done, where they've been, or what they're going through, I will get them. And draw them unto myself. That's what he said. If I be lifted up, I'll draw them in unto myself. Amen. He was a family man. You know, family goes a long ways, don't it? I love my family. My intermediate family, my extended family. I love my church family. I love every one of you. I really do. And I die for every one of you. I'll make that promise to you this morning. And we're living in a day it might come down to that. I've been reading a lot about uh, Hitler and all of that. And what a terrible, terrible time. Those people were persecuted because they were God's people. Do you not see in America today we're being persecuted because we're God's people? Yeah. Amen. Every day. You turn the news on and we're being persecuted. He was a family man. But here's the point I want to get to this morning. In Genesis chapter 14, we read it. Verse 20, he said, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. He just didn't give him his money. He gave him a tenth of everything he had. Well, glory. I feel like stopping there and preaching just a minute. If we'll give him 10% of our money, I guarantee you we'll never want. Amen. I believe if we give him 10% of our prayer time, He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Somebody better say amen right there. Amen. I believe if we'll give him 10% of our time in the day, 2.4 hours, let's just round up to two and a half. If we'll give it to Jesus, I promise we'll be a blessed people. Amen. Boy, if we're getting a prayer pause for two and a half hours, it's hard to tell when revival will break out. It might break out up Flatridge Road first and Tees Road second. And we'll just all meet in the middle right downtown at the old red light sugar grove. Somebody say amen right there. If we're just giving tithes of all. You know what? If we'd spend two and a half hours of the, of the day in his service, boy, I'm telling you, God bless. You say, well, I don't got time. Make it time. Make it time. Get up an hour early. Go to bed an hour late. Get up two hours early. Go to bed two hours late. Take a longer lunch break. Well, glory. Somebody say Amen. Y'all would do better on that on the lunch break. I mean, y'all eat fried chicken, by the way. 
<laughs> Amen. But here we have a, a mysterious figure in your Bible. And I love this because scholars can't put their finger on it. I believe that's God doing that. There's a fellow by the name of Melchizedek. I told you we was going to have fun with him. And we really don't know who he was. We do know that he was a priest of the Most High God. But it said that he had no start of days and no end of days. And he just shows up. Sounds a little bit like the Holy Ghost of God to me, don't Amen. you? But they can't tell whether that fellow was just a priest. It was Christ himself manifested in a priestly figure. Or if it was just some priest along life's road for Abram. But I like him. Because he said, blessed be Abram. Possessor because God is the possessor. Not because what Abram does. But because what God does. You see, I love that Abrahamic covenant. It's not a bilateral covenant. It wasn't contingent upon what Abraham could do for God. But it was what God could do for Abraham. You see there in the next chapter, about chapter 15, we find that a great sleep fell upon Abraham. And it said there was a furnace and a flaming torch walked through the middle of that sacrifice. Y'all ever looked at the mercy seat of God? How many of you know what the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant is? Raise your hand. Oh, wait, we might have to do a series on the Ark of the Covenant. Well, the Ark of the Covenant, the Old Testament, was a type of Christ. And only once a year, the great high priest could go in and make a blood atonement for yours and my sin in the nation of Israel. And we find out this, that when he went in, he had to be pure. He had to be clean. He had to be in a priestly robe and have a pure mind and a pure heart. And only one time a year, he could go in and place blood on the mercy seat. That was Christ. In the old that was the only way that priest could make an atonement for you men. But here's the thing. I don't know about you, but I like going to Jesus myself and not depending Amen. on him. Amen, and you all need. We can go to petition the throne room ourselves. Well, see, that mercy seat was the most beautiful thing. It was holy. You couldn't put your hand to it. You couldn't touch it. I'm glad we can uh, touch God, don't you, Christ himself, Amen. through our prayer life and through our study. Well, here's the, that mercy seat in the New Testament. How many of you remember on that third and this morning when the stone was rolled away? Don't no, say amen. That's why we're here this morning. Now one of those gospel accounts, maybe two of them said this, and when the stone was rolled away, and the linen clothes was laid over here, and the napkin was folded at the head, that means I'm coming back in Jewish tradition. But didn't you see the Ark of the Covenant being manifested in Christ Jesus? It said there was an angel, well glory, sitting at the feet, and there was one sitting at the head. Now, I don't know about you, but if you study that ark out, and we're getting right back to tithes, I promise you, you'll find that the cherubims were pointing towards one another, and the mercy seat was right in the middle. Amen. 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 Jesus was trying to show us all along who he was and what he was going to be, and we just paid attention way back yonder. But it said this, Melchizedek said this, Blessed be Abraham. And Abraham says, I like this fella. And I believe of God himself, and I'm just going to give him tithes of all. Now, here's one thing I know. If you read the preceding chapters, it said that Abraham was rich with gold, silver, and cattle. And guess what? When he died, he had a, a lot more than he started out with. I told you this wasn't to get rich quick. I'm talking about being obedient to God this morning. Let's look at what the Word says. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, I'll give you some new Matthew 5, 5, the Sermon on the Mount, what's it say? Blessed are the meek. That's humble. Remember I said Abram was an humble man. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Solomon said in Proverbs chapter number 3, here's the favor I was talking about in the Old Testament. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with thy first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now I'm going to show you faithful in the new. In the Gospel of Mark in the 12th chapter in the 41th verse, I love this. This is Jesus. 
He said, and Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites, by the way, that's about four pennies worth, with, which make a farthing. And he called on his disciples and he said, boys, come here and look at this. You see all these wealthy people casting in because of their abundance? But look what he says. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, this poor widow hath cast more in. Did y'all catch that? That she cast more in. That, was, that all that which hath cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had. Even all her living. I told you he's a family man, right? To train up a child in the way she go when he's old, he'll not depart from it. We well, see there's a, a bloodline there, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the nation. I find it funny in the 28th chapter, Brother Michael Higgins this morning, it's funny how the Lord works. In verse 20 of chapter 20, he said, Jacob, bow the vow, saying, If God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go. And will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I might come to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tent unto me. That study I read, y'all boys, started this thing, says this. If you'll start telling your children about tithing and offering and getting in God's service in all manner, they're more likely to do it when they get old. Where's Chloe? Chloe, come here. I'm not bragging on me. I'm going to brag on Jesus why, and she's going to punch me later for it. A couple months ago, Young lady had a yard sale. She made sixty-eight dollars. Sixty-eight dollars. And when it was over, and all things were packed up, I told her, "Give me seven dollars." And she said, "Why that?" And I said, "Because that belongs to the Lord." And she got mad at me. And she went to her room, and I don't know if she prayed or what, but hallelujah. The next time she got some money, she went out, number one, and gave a tenth of all she had. She went out and bought what she wanted with the money that was hers that she had earned. And when it's riding back home, God is my witness. I haven't said no more than since that day of giving God what's his. And she said, Daddy, I give him his first, and I bought all that I wanted and needed. Well, glory. And I got $9 left. And if it be all right to you, I'd like to put it in the offering plate at church on Sunday. Woo! Teach them while they're young. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. This ain't about money, church. This is about being in love with God. Amen. And trusting what he said, I'll bless them that bless thee, that's what he told Abraham. And I'll curse thee that curse thee. Curse them that curse thee. Raise them up. Malachi in the third chapter said this. In the sixth verse, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Do you realize that Jacob done this? He said, I see no granddaddy Abram. Give God a tenth of everything and more that he ever had. And I saw daddy Isaac do the same thing. And you know what? It worked for them less. I think I'll just try it a while. And, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob give Jesus everything they had. And look how they were blessed. Now look what he says. Seven. Verse of the third chapter of Malachi says, Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. 
Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But she say, when in, where in shall we return? Listen to what this verse says. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? And God said, in tithes and offerings. In tithes and offerings. Bring me all the tithes into the storehouse, that's the church, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, it will not open, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room, well, glory, I like it, enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord. Do you not find it funny that the next to the last chapter in the Old Testament talks about tithes and offerings? And after the fourth chapter of the book of Malachi, there is 400 years where God never says a word about anything. I do believe when God left us with the sayings in Malachi, he was trying to point us in the right direction in the things of not only salvation, but in the things of prosperity, in the things of obedience. Because there was going to be 400 years when not one word was jotted down by a man of God by inspiration. Pretty dark time, don't you think? But Malachi says, bring it to the storehouse and you ain't got enough barns or buildings or fields to hold out the blessings of God because he'll open the window. That's just one window, by the way. I don't know how many is in that city, but it's a lot. And that's just one. Brother Danny, you come on, I'm that done. You say, well, that don't help me a lot. I'm going to tell you about paying tithes to God's house. <coughs> I want to be, say this, thank you for being a given church. Thank you for being a given community. We've seen that in the last few days. But that 10%, that 10% goes to God. Don't go to me. Don't go to anybody else sitting around. Don't go to pay your neighbor's lot bill. We'll get into that later, at a later date. It's God's. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to close to show you how God will bless a faithful giver. 95% of you all rode by a destination this morning that I love and it's dear to my heart. And y'all don't even know it. And most of you don't know the story behind it. You see, in the winter, in January of 1935, which was ending the Great Depression, there was a little boy born in the mountains of Craigsville, West Virginia, by the name of Bernard Coffin. I like that name. Coffin Doctor. He grew up poor. When he was 16 years old, he joined the United States Marine Corps. Served six years as an infantry. He fought at the Battle of Iwo Jima, Nagasaki, the bloodiest battles of all World War II. Come back home to Craigsville, Craigsville, West Virginia, and work for a company that just washed coal. And he washed coal for several years from the time he was about 24 to the time he was about 42. And he started him a little side business for the old industry. You can't help give God. No more hard said, I want some crosses planted everywhere across these great United States. Every one of you here drove past them this morning. There's two white ones and one gold one. The gold one in the middle represents the royalty of Christ. And the two on the outside represent Bernard's head, humanity, and their sin. In 1984, he began to plant two white crosses and one gold one in 29 states 
across the United States, in the Philippines, and Zambia, Africa, and well, Florida, there's one still standing in the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., and he said, I want all men to know the love of Christ. Well, I want to tell you what he done. In 1993, he suffered a heart attack. Had a, had a quadruple bypass. And he said, it's time to sell the business. I can't do it no more. So in 93, he sold all that he had. Kept the house for him and his wife and liquidated all assets. And as you drive by these crosses every Sunday morning, you think of how a man gave to God and what a man done for God. He sold that business out for $3 million. And on his deathbed, he literally had 10 sins to his name. Because, sure, Lord, there's 29 sets of crosses across America. And it's we're in the hustle and bustle of life. If you see one of them, you can say, that's what Christ done for me and my family. Then I might be here today. There's a man that give all to God because why? Because he trusted him with everything that he had. There ain't a bunch of us to sit side of hell and give three million dollars for the work of God. But I tell you what, if you would, he'll bless you beyond us. Here we are 30 some odd years later talking about one yellow cross, two white and Standing beside Highway 16 in Sugar Grove, Virginia. Why? Because God was faithful to a man that was faithful to trust him with all that he had. Now I'm going to tell you this and I'll be done. A few years ago, I know what it's like to do it all day this way. You may die. It's all right. I'll be the Lone Ranger. And I know what it's like to be in business for David. I know what it's like to have a pocket full of money new cars and everything I could ever want. I know what it's like. You know what? I just about lost everything. But my family and my my little home that we're blessed with, I died. I'm talking vehicles. I'm talking everything that we've worked for. And part of my family lost the rest of it. Lost it all. Because why? Because I was going in David's way. Now David Medley ain't got no money. But David Medley ain't got no needs either. About four years ago, I said, Lord, if you'll just become my business. <laughs> Woo, glory. You take the majority share and I'll take the minority share. If you'll just be my business partner and you handle all this. And I can't tell you back there since my wife, if I want to go out to a restaurant and have me a 24 ounce ribeye steak, I'd pay cash for it this morning. No, I ain't got no millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands in the bank, but there is nothing in the Medley household that is needed or wanted this morning. And it's not because that it was done David's way or Jessica's way or the church's way. It's because God's put a touch on the man's mouth and I just give it all to him. Now, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you tithe, and I don't care. I don't even look. But you bet you better give God what's His. Why? Because it's His anyway. And if you want the blessings in your life, you'll give. You'll give. Me and my wife had the opportunity to be a blessing to somebody a few months back. Don't know the man saw a picture of it. Young man. We fooled Lord. Brother Larry, you think I got liberty to tell his story and be all right? He's on the other one. A few months ago, me and Mama back there paid all the bills. Had a little money in my pocket. We started a little savings for those hard times. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And I got a phone call said a young man needs to graduate. But he can't because he owes a little money on his lunch account. I could have come to the church and we'd have paid for it just like that. But I was full of glory. But as I got that message, God said, you're going to do it. And you alone I was thinking, Lord, what are you talking about? He said, you're going to do it, and you alone. So me and Mama figured up all the bills that week. Paid every one of them. Paid every one of them. Had a little money to go home. Gas in the tank. 
and we had six hundred and fifty dollars to our name. That boy couldn't eat a meal at school because he had to charge them all for a lot of years. I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on you. Just Amen. listen to what he's telling me. And his bill was six hundred and fifty dollars. Mama said, "Preacher, you must make me cry." I said, "Well, I'm gonna beat you there, cause we gonna give it to you." That's all we had. God said, "Get it," and let me show you what I can do. I and my wife stuck it in an envelope and stuck it in the hand of a brother of this church, and he delivered it on Monday morning. And way back yonder in May, this young boy got to put his tassel whoop, over it. Put his tassel on and start this walk alive because God's been good to a dumb old preacher boy in southwest Virginia and his family. And he was allowing us to say, hey, I'll give you this much. Let me show you how to get a little more. So you can ask her. And since we give that little bit of money, and I mean it's a little bit, I cannot tell you. I cannot tell you how God blessed me and my family. Of all the things that we ever dreamed of. And you know what? We don't do it without prayer and supplication because I know what it's like to do it without prayer and supplication. If you ain't in the will of God, don't do it. But you give. And God will bless you. The altar's open this morning.